to the Lord and welcome Pastor Todd as he comes this morning. Is here. Thank you for being here this morning. I cannot wait to be with you Wednesday night, all of our covenant partners as we share together some. We're going to laugh, we're going to eat, we're going to have a wonderful time. So put that on your calendar. Tonight, I'm telling you tonight, Bishop Kevin Wallace in the house is going to be fire. I received a testimony uh, this past week from a lady from Arizona. I want to read it to you as we begin. Uh, you may want to go in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, but I want to take just a few moments to talk to you about all that God is doing as a result of um, your ministry that the Holy Spirit is doing through you. And I, um, I am grateful for just such a dynamic, wonderful, life-giving church. Are you glad to be a part of Christ Fellowship Church? She said, my dad, Alfred, had been in ICU for three weeks battling with COVID, has been in, in ICU battling COVID for the last three weeks. He's a diabetic at 68 years of, old, of age. My father read the Bible every morning and would give thanks to the Lord. The nurse told my aunt it doesn't look good for him, but I will not accept that. I stand strong in faith that the Lord is with you or with us. I need prayers for healing for him. So we're going to pray uh, and want you to pray here in just a moment. We are in Phoenix, Arizona, and would love to visit. My husband went. I love this. Now watch this. My husband went, and he was not a believer. <laughs> you have to imagine living in Phoenix hearing about a move of God's happening in a little town called Dawsonville, what in the world would compel you to get on a plane and come to this place? He says, my husband went and he was not a believer and now he believes. <laughs> my Lord Jesus. And, and, and here's the reason why he believes. You ready? He was not a believer and now believes because of the miracles God did when he went to your church. Amen. Did you catch that, Christ Fellowship? There, there is a man saved today because of the kingdom of God has come. To Christ Fellowship Church at this season, at this moment, where what Jesus did on the earth when he walked is now manifest in our very presence. Do not take that for granted. I'm here to declare to you, great is your reward. Touch your neighbor and say, your reward's coming. I, I want to show you a, a, an image on the screen and, and share another testimony. I just love to share testimonies. Um, this precious family came from Middle Georgia, Perry, Georgia, to be exact, and um, um, there were like a lot of them. And speaking of Perry, Georgia, we're going to be there in January or February somewhere at this particular church. Uh, but this is the story. She testified and sent me an email. She said, my son Israel, don't you love that name? has a rare genetic skin condition called Netherton's syndrome. It affects his skin, allergies, immune system, just to name a few. Many children that have this condition usually fail to thrive for the first few years of their lives. Prior to his baptism at the North Georgia Revival, Israel had the following issues. Two heart issues developmental delays to thrive, issues with eating, walking, coordination, and arms stayed tight to his chest.
You know, from time to time, we'll get a little email from someone that says, why are you baptizing infants? And, and, and their mindset is more of, of a Catholic of baptizing an infant for conversion. And, and at no time ever have we ever said that or even would imply that we do that. But I just remember Jesus often would take children and bless them. And wherever he is, they took the children to him. And it just so seems to be, or not seems, but it is a matter of fact that the Lord's meeting people in the water. So parents, um, get your child in the water. I don't care if they're three months old, three weeks old, three days old. If there's a condition, meet them in the water. Mm -hmm. He was an introvert, ear issues, several allergies, severe wheat allergy, causes restricted breathing and swelling. The night of his baptism at the North Georgia Revival, we watched him begin to change. The only way to describe it is that the Holy Spirit touched our son. He began walking, walking great and interacting with others. He started talking to us, dancing. Singing and praising. When he came up out of the water, she said, you can see in the pictures, he came up with his arms raised to the Lord. Now this is what she said. His arms were never stretched out before. He no longer has heart issues. His ears are much better than they used to be. And he now eats everything, including things with wheat. Turn to me. My Lord, come on, give him praise. You may be seated. If he did it for Israel, he will do it for you and your child. You know, uh, before I begin my message, America is demonized, and uh, where did we go wrong? I just can't help just to revel in the moment that not all is wrong in America. And, and I just want to brag on, on Christ Fellowship. I just want to brag on the church uh, because, as Pastor Marty said, this week is 201. This is 201 weeks. This is literally um, going on four years. And at no point, at not one spot, have you wavered from your commitment to host the presence of God. You continue to pray. You continue to make the deposit. You continue to push. 
I know your body's weary. I know you're physically fatigued. I know you're mentally struggling. Is it worth it? Is it too demanding? Is it costing to me too much? And you feel that you've neglected others in your life. And your stresses on your job, stresses at home, and you're thinking, I just can't take it anymore. And I know it is challenging to be a part of a church in revival. But I just want to say to you, you've made it four years. And with every high achiever, high capacity leader, with everybody that's always in front, there'll be from time to time that you will feel the call to quit and to withdraw. The moment you withdraw at any moment, mentally, physically, and emotionally, you're gone. Because your flesh will take over and take complete authority over you because it feels good to rest. It feels good not to have the pressure to pray, to push in, and to come. And the devil will make it as sweet and palatable to your spiritual palate as possible. But Jesus says, he who puts his hand to the plow, he says, I take no pleasure in any that take a look back. You have been chosen by the presence and by the power of the Lord to host his presence. It takes, I got the report on our spec sheet, I just found this out, 275 to 300 people every Sunday night to host this revival. I had no idea. I said, Pastor, you're about 100 people. She flopped that thing on my desk and she put a number on there. And it's 275 to 300 people. Thank you, church, for not pulling back. Thank you for not giving in to your mind that says you deserve not to go. Or you've paid your time. One day you're going to stand before him and he's going to tell you, well done. And I promise you, there is a mother in South Georgia that thanks you. There is a wife in Arizona that says, because that you prayed the deposit and not gave up, my husband is born again. Give yourself in the Lord Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Tonight will be no different. Today I'm going to look at 1 Peter chapter 2 for just a brief moment. And I want to talk to you and finish maybe the message I started last week on America's demonized. I appreciate all the prayers, all the encouragement, all of the uh, um, support that you guys gave throughout the week and praying at this moment. This is very significant what I'm going to say today. I believe it will carry some weight. America, I feel, is demonized. Now, when I say demonized, it doesn't mean the extreme barbarous behavior which we normally categorize or stereotype people that are demon-possessed. When I say demonized, and I believe it's the most accurate New Testament word to describe someone or something under demonic oppression, possession, and influence. When I say demonized, I mean it can be subtle. Under the surface, somewhat hidden. But when there is a demonization of an organization, a leadership, an individual, it always carries an agenda, literally to erode and eventually to destroy. Demonization is very real. But people in the West don't want to talk about it, mm -hmm. including many Christians. People do not think that it's possible. People don't think that that doesn't happen in our culture. 
And sadly, we've not talked about it much. Therefore, we have not had it on our radar. But the Bible is filled with examples of people being demonized. Today in our Western culture, we medicate rather than bring deliverance. Many demons are being medicated. Mm -hmm. When someone is demonized, listen to me, or an organization, or an entity, because entities can be demonized. Governments can be demonized. It doesn't mean that everybody in the government has a devil. School systems can be demonized. Arms of the medical community can be demonized. Churches can be demonized. So I'm just equal opportunity offender. Okay, everybody's, no one's off limits. When something or someone or an organization is demonized, it means it's, it's under the subtle control and carrying out a very dark and demonic agenda. When someone is demonized over time, it causes you to lose your mind. And I'm not talking so much that you become uh, in need of medicine or in need of psychiatric care. You just lose rational thought. Common sense rationalism. You become delusional. You lose focus of what truth is. Hard to discern what is right and wrong. Which is clear and unclear. And I think America is demonized because she is struggling with truth. Mm -hmm. We have adopted the mindset of subjective truth as opposed to uh, objective truth. Objective truth is truth is truth. Whether you feel that it is or not, or whether it bothers you or not, truth is truth. Subjective truth depends upon that person whether or not he wants to embrace that. Common, concrete truth is truth for them. It may be truth for you, but not truth for them. And that particular truth is based upon your upbringing, your feelings, your emotions, your society, your friends, your culture, all of these things develop what truth is to you. And we're entering and have, I'm not entering, we are fully in full gallop mode of literally of losing our culture because of the nonsense of subjective truth. Even to this day, this is why I say some parts of medicine are demonized. It doesn't mean every doctor has a devil. It doesn't mean every nurse has a devil. I'm just talking about there's an overarching spirit speaking to people of influence, trying to change common, everyday, basic medicine, science, and biology that we have adhered to for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, if not before, literally at the beginning of humanity. And so now people are looking at us and they have changed this in the medical uh, arena and now encouraging universities and college professors never to say that there's just one gender or two genders, male and female. You know this. This is nothing new. We've seen this. This is what's happening. But for medical entities that have been respectful in the past, to come out and say, even though you have the, the makings of a girl, a female, you're really not that if you choose not to be that. That is demonized. I'm not saying that child has a demon. I'm not saying the parent has the demon. I'm just saying that mindset is demonized. It is subtle, it is influential, it's confusing. Talk to me. Does that make sense? Okay. 
And I'm not being insensitive this morning. I'm just telling you because all of us know someone that identifies as something other than they are. But somewhere along the way, we've left objective truth and we've come over here to subjective truth. And, and, and literally, I heard a conversation the other day. I wrote it down a few months ago and then it actually I heard a podcast about this that now there are some people that believe that two plus two no longer equals four. You see, once you begin to go down this slippery slope, there's no end to it. And, and, and here's what people are saying. Well, ever since the beginning of time, you take two items and you add two to it, all ra- sound, logical, rational people would say you have uno, dos, tres. You have four. Y'all didn't know I was bilingual, did you? You have four. But now there's a conversation that is happening over here to a student that doesn't agree with that, develops his own truth of two plus two to them can equal five. So I am forbidden to take what I know to be truth and try to convince someone who has subjected truth to them two plus two is five. To me, to bring truth to them in an emphatic, I become insensitive, I become bigoted, I become narrow-minded, I become offensive. All my life, red is red. But to someone else, and I'm talking about if you're colorblind, I'm talking about someone, well, I don't like that color red, that color red's offensive to me. I'm going to call that one obtruse. (laughs) And we have been so conditioned with the cancel culture that you must comply. You must accept their version of truth to do otherwise makes you someone that is unloving, uncaring, unkind. Are you with me? Okay. So remember last week I brought this up to you. I brought this uh, long boy, queer, gen- gender queer, all of this pornographic books that mother, all this stuff that they have in public libraries that show sexual acts that literally show a man having sex with a boy. Uh, a board came along and said, we're going to look at this. And, and then they determined it was not pedophilia. Let me, listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. That's demonization. Yes. When you can't see a grown man having sex with a boy that is in a book that is um, an uh, artist's rendering of it, having sex, it's pornography. It's an image. And they look at that and they say, this does not violate the pedophilia rules. To make matters worse, I just spoke on this last Sunday. To make matters worse, this past week, they did this. Outrageously offensive, Fairfax County Library puts notorious books next to the Bible in holiday display. Church, listen to me. Not every school system... But the public school system in the United States of America is under the leadership and control of folks that are being demonized. Not every teacher, not every principal. I thank God for every teacher, every principal. I thank God for John Barge, who is going to be running for the state school superintendent in the state of Georgia. But this nonsense right here does not belong in any public library, especially when a child can go and look at it. So where did we go wrong? How did we get to this place? 
I have multiple, multiple reasons why I believe, but I want to hit one square in the throat and answer the question, why and where did this happen? The responsibility of such logic and such reason came as a result when the church surrendered, gave in, and collapsed when the church dropped the ball. The church pulled out of public discourse. The church, because we didn't want to be labeled that group, those people, always standing up against something negative. Since we didn't want to be labeled that group, whenever you pull out and leave a vacuum, something always fills it. And when the church pulled away, and I'm going to give you the slogan that they use. It sounds good. It sounds Bible. Here's what they said. We do not want to be known for what we're against. We want to be known for what we are for. Remember I told you last week, any group that's going to bring up, any group in the, in the country, if you have a good slogan and, 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 and it's the right slogan, then you can't argue against them because, of, because you become against them, right? You understand what I'm saying? It's the great slogan. We don't want to be known for what we're against. We want to be known for what we're for. So here's what we, we're for your happiness. We're for your peace. We're for your longevity. We're for your prosperity. We're for you being positive role models in the community, great, uplifting, inspiring parents, and all of those things are wonderful, and the church needs to be about that. But when we decided to say, we don't want to be known for what we are against, we just want to be known for the positive things. When we pulled back, guess who filled the void? If there is no voice of truth, where's the truth going to come from? You going to trust a politician? You going to trust who's running for president? You going to trust? You hear what I'm saying? Other than John Barge, of course. But you understand what I'm saying. Where's the truth going to come from? Truth in our government comes from lobbyists that influence people with big bucks. A guy runs the campaign, I'm going to stand up for this A, B, and C, and all of a sudden a lobbyist comes and, and, and slides under the table a couple hundred thousand dollars. Your vote changes just like that. You cannot change this country totally by putting right people in the office. You change this culture by the church taking the position that God gave it to be, watch this, salt. And he says, what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Hmm. You see, salt flavors, but salt also gives you great taste, but also salt burns. You ever been to the ocean, got into the, got into the ocean when all of a sudden you had a cut? Yes. It burns, but guess what it does? Yes. The Bible says you are the light of the world. A city set on top of a hill. And he says, do not. What did the church say? We don't want to be known what we're against. We just want to be known for what we're for. And if we find out that it's not helping you, we'll change the light. At no time did Jesus ever propagate a church or his people to the point of saying, I need you to pull back. They crucified him for his stance against 
They beheaded John the Baptist because he called Herod out. The problem today with preachers is nobody wants to kill them. So where did this whole thing begin to fall apart? It's when the church became more interested in gathering a crowd and attracting followers and gathering people than being a mouthpiece for the Lord in all that he stands for. Not just just standing against the problems, but also propagating the good things, the hope, the peace, the love, the joy, the grace, the mercy, all of the whole package, but we eliminated a significant portion of the package. And I put the responsibility of that on preachers. And the pulpit. For years, the preaching of the gospel kept this country safe. It is the moral center. It is the needle. As the, as the pulpits go, so go the nation. So goes the nation. As the pulpit goes, so goes the nation. This is a sacred desk of proclaiming truth. Hard truth, disgusting truth, offensive truth. But the pulpit has to discuss truth. Do you hear what I'm saying? Talk to me. Charles Finney made this quote right here. And I want you to, three slides, so take a picture of this. Brethren, our preaching, listen to what it says. Our preaching will bear its legitimate fruits. If morality prevails in the land, the fault is ours in a great degree. If there is a decay of conscience, the pulpit is responsible for it. If the public press lacks moral discrimination, the pulpit is responsible for it. He adds, the church is degenerate and worldly. The pulpit is responsible for it. If the world loses its interest in religion, the pulpit is responsible for it. If Satan rules in our halls of legislation, the pulpit is responsible for it. If our politics become so corrupt that the very foundations of our government are ready to fall away, the pulpit is responsible for it. Let us not ignore this fact, my dear brethren. But let us lay it to the heart and be thoroughly aware to our responsibility in respect to the morals of this nation. Written by Charles Finney in 1875. Let me just go on the record to say to you today that the gospel of Jesus Christ is truth. Jesus said it, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is objective truth. And our pulpits, listen to me, our pastors and our preachers must preach this truth. God never ever asked me to build his church. Not one time, at any point, At any moment. He said he would build the church. I am simply responsible for declaring the truths in this book. That's it. Mm -hmm. And to try to live a life that attracts the presence of God to this building. Do you hear what I'm saying? This is important for us today. The reason we're finding out 
that we're having this moral dilemma that things of this nature Mother school school for refusing to allow seventh grade trans daughter to play boys soccer. Now I'm going to tell you why we're having this issue. We're having the issue because the church decided I don't want to be known for what I'm against, but I want to be known for what I'm for. We never had this problem in the 60s and the 70s. We had different problems, but not 60s and 70s and early 80s. There was a strong voice coming from the pulpit. But then there came a movement that said, you know what, let's water down our message so that we can attract the unchurched to the church. Yeah. News bulletin, news bulletin. The church is not for the unchurched. So I went right over your head. This gathering today is not for the unbeliever. This is ecclesia. This is the body coming together for encouragement, edification, and instruction in righteousness. Sing, as Ephesians says, when you come together singing songs and hymns to one another, edifying one another, because outside the walls of this church, sometimes it's very hellacious. But in the Bible days, they would chop your head off. So the, in the Bible days, the, un, the church service wasn't for the unchurched. Now, they could come, but it wasn't designed for them. The reason we decided to design church services for the unchurched is because we weren't equipping the church to go outside the walls of the church to share the gospel. So we said, let's take that responsibility off y'all and let the superstar preacher be the soul winner with all of his swagger, teach you guys how to do it and show you how to demonstrate it. So we brought in the haze, we brought in the lights, we brought in the lasers to try to appeal to the unsaved. And I'm not against all those things. I mean, heaven's going to have lights. rainbow colors and spectrums and the jewels. You know, I'm not against that, but what I'm, I'm against the theatrics of trying to reach unsaved people in a sacred hour of edification. And so what we did, you liked it, not you, but people liked it because you know what? I get to hear the same thing over and over and over and over again, and my pastor's not going to go fringe on me. Pastor's not going to go French. He's not going to deal with what I watch on TV. He's not going to deal with my cussing. He's not going to deal with my social drinking. He's not going to deal with my lack of church attendance because I'm not his goal. The goal is my neighbor. And so you can sit in one of those type of churches for years and be spiritually not know anything other than the blood, the cross, Cute sermon series we'll roll out there and get your neighbor here because I'm going to talk about seven ways to be a positive parent in this very demonic world. And all the while, they don't know how to lay hands on themselves to get healed. They don't know their authority. They don't know who they are in Christ. They don't know how to lead someone to Jesus. They don't know how to cast out a devil. They don't know how to disciple someone else. Well, all I've been told to get them to church, let my cool pastor show them the way. And so we pulled back. Church has never been and was never established. The ecclesia, the, the gathering together was never established to get unsaved people saved. Now, do unsaved people come and get saved? Absolutely. Dude from Phoenix. And there will be moments that we say, all right, next week is the day that I'm preaching on getting people saved. Bring your neighbors. Boom. This crud right here happens because this lady is surrounded. I know where they live in Martinsville, Indiana. It says it in the article. There are churches all around there. And somehow, maybe her little girl went to a youth group 
where it was more about video games and how cool the youth pastor is, how he dresses, how he looks. Let me tell you something. If you, if, if you build your youth ministry upon what the youth pastor looks like, there's always going to be somebody prettier than you. I digress. Watch this. The mother of the girl who is referred to the suit as AC because she is a minor is a seventh grader at John R. Wooden Middle School and is being represented by the American Civil Liberties Union of Indiana. The student also claims she has been misgendered or called a girl instead of her male gender identity, according to Indianapolis Star Telegram, quoting the lawsuit by saying that the school was unfairly denying a transgender student access to the, now watch this, to the boys' bathroom by not letting him participate in boys' sports and refusing to be called by male pronouns. Now, objective truth is, okay, Sweetie, you're born this way. And this is what a boy looks like. This is what a girl looks like. This is basic biology, not even 101, it's double A. I mean, it's just basic, you, okay, okay, you're a girl. Well, I don't feel like a girl. You're a girl. Well, I feel like a boy, and I identify with a boy. You are a girl. All right, now somewhere along the way, we just got tired of fighting that. Okay, if you feel like a girl, you can be a boy today. But it doesn't change truth, but it's truth to her because it's subjective truth. He feels that he is being singled out and he is not accepted for who he is. See, the logic is demonized. According to court documents, the student is a patient at Gender Health Program at Riley and IU Health in Indianapolis where he is receiving care and treatment for gender dysphoria. He's on medication to prevent him for having period, for him having periods. They've already, see, the newspaper already bought into it. All right. For having periods and when medically appropriate, he will start masculinizing, uh, mascu- masculinizing Hormones. The student has been presenting as a boy since the fifth grade. His mother has petitioned petitioned a Morgan County State Board, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The suit is requesting that the court require the school to treat AC as a boy in all respects, allowing him to use male restrooms and other facilities to refer to him as a male with matching pronouns and let him play on the boys' soccer team next fall. I won't just, I got a flash here. They're going to cater. But somebody, somebody with rational mind Basic math, basic science, and it's funny to me that they, they tell Christians that we are science deniers. Y'all are science, de- y'all don't believe the science. Follow the science. Well, quit changing science. What do you want us to believe? You want us to believe 2,000, 6,000 years of science or all because some 10-year-old gets upset? And we're changing science. We're writing all the books. Somebody's got to step up and stop the insanity. Now, let me tell you where it's going to have to start. Now, watch this from the pulpit. Now, here's here's the negative of this. When it happens, we all know someone in our communities that have a daughter, have a son like this, and they will so clamp down on you that they will put so much pressure on you, not me, but on you. I can't believe you go to a church. You know my daughter. You know her. She's kind, she's sweet, and she's gentle. And if you are going to associate with that church, you and I can no longer be friends. Write it down. No pastor can support same-sex marriage, homosexuality, transgender, abortion, and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. None. Absolutely none. None. Zero. Nada. Ain't gonna happen. Shouldn't happen. Shouldn't even be on the radar. No pastor can support same-sex marriage, homosexuality, transgender, abortion, and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can't do it. Now, I know, I know what's coming toward me. I know that. 
I know what's ha- I know what's coming toward me. And it won't come from unsaved people. It'll come from pastors. So I just go on the record. Maybe I'm worth killing. Maybe there'll be a group of pastors that will flip this whole nation around that somehow, some way, get electrocuted, get executed, get beheaded for the truth. Because we're not going to let our society go down without a fight. We're not going to let our society go down without a fight. We're going to fight. We're going to scratch. We're going to claw. We're going to proclaim. We're going to do it in love. We're going to do it in mercy. We're going to do it in grace. We're going to speak the truth. Uh-huh. We're going to speak the truth. Now, we'll need to add double, triple, quadruple security. I understand that. But hear what the Bible says about the gospel in and of itself. The gospel is the most offensive message on the planet. You think about it. Not in the Bible Belt. Go tell a Muslim that Jesus is the only way, truth, and the life. Oh, we got it nice here. Live in Pakistan. Go to Iran. And you stand up and you preach on the corner that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. No, 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 he's a prophet, they say. No, he's the Son of God. Tell them that Jesus Christ died for their sins and on the third day came back from the dead and Muhammad is still in the grave. And you tell them, unless they repent and accept this son called Jesus, the Messiah, from Israel, Jew. And it says, unless you repent, you'll die and go to hell. Well, we got a private cell for you. Follow me. This gospel is the most offensive gospel on the planet. And it has, listen, it has only begun to become offensive to our culture. Because there are pastors that are coming up out of the darkness. They're coming from the closet. They're literally coming out of hiding that God has said. They may only pastor 25 or 30 people, but God says, I got a voice right here with this man. He'll not coddle. He'll not give in. He'll not be swayed by peer pressure. He'll not give in. That he's going to speak my truth. And he's going to prepare the way of the Lord. Your Bible calls the gospel offensive in and of itself. He says either you stand on it or it will crush you. Jesus continually talked hard sayings to his disciples. And they came to him and said, Jesus, you need to cut it back a little bit because everybody's leaving you. And he says, will you leave me also? It's a hard saying to look at a family Someone called to the ministry and says, I need you to go to a place that you may never come back from. And to have the mother talking him out of it, trying to talk him out. Oh, Jesus would never ask you to do that. You got to put family this and family that. He would never ask you to sacrifice that. See how we pulled it back? See, when you come to Jesus, you lose all rights. But there's no more offensive care and there's no more offensive book on the planet than this right here. That's why they wanted to eradicate it back then. That's why they're going to try to stomp it out right now and coming up with new versions of this. 1 Peter chapter 2. I'll just give it to you real quick and then I got to close here in just a moment. I'll close in just a second. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 28. Are you there? Excuse me, verse 8, not 28. (laughs) I'm going to add scripture. (laughs) Thank you, Lord. Listen to this, verse 7. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. Listen, to those who believe, he's precious. But But to those who are disobedient, 
The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. Do you let what I just said get out? The slide I showed a few moments ago, and you watch the vitriol that comes toward this house. The temperature of the house is about to increase. But you're going to have to decide, will I go to a church? Not a perfect church, not perfect leadership, not perfect people. But to a folks, will I unite myself and gather my people, my family, around a church that speaks the truth? Listen to me. Every child needs to hear what I just said. Do not, do not forbid your children to hear what your pastor just said. Because they hear the other side of it. They're looking for truth. And if mom and daddy won't stand upon this truth, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, if they won't stand, then, then they're left to decide what truth is. And their truth is going to be what makes their friends feel good. You let a nine-year-old stand up in that classroom or a 10-year-old stand up in that classroom and say to that 10-year-old girl, you're a girl. God created you to be a girl. He makes no mistakes. You may be mentally confused, but I can help you with that. I can help you with that. I just wonder what my parents would have done if I walked into the room and said, Daddy, I feel like a girl today. He'd say, where's my belt? <laughs> I'm going to drive that. I'm going to drive that right out of your body right now. I'm going to take care of that right now. You ain't thinking that way. I, I didn't raise no sissy. I didn't raise no girl. Look down, boy. That's what would happen. I'd go to my granddaddy. I'm spending the week with him at Smith Lake. I, granddaddy, I don't, I, you know, uh, I know we're going out to eat at, at Harry's, but can I go to the girls' bathroom because I just... Uh, grab me by the nap of the neck. Where's that leadership? All right, Stanley. If I don't know how to end. I really don't. So here's what we need to do. I'm not done. I'm done today, but I'm not done. I'll pick up next week because we've got to stay on this a little bit longer. Okay. I know it's the Christmas season. You're going to get, you're going to get everything you need Wednesday night. <laughs> you're going to get everything you need Wednesday night for Christmas. Are you all all right? Okay, all right, let's pray for our churches. Can we do that? All right, let's just lift up our voices. Let's pray for our churches. While y'all pray, I'm gonna put my belt back on. All right, let's lift up our voices. Come on. Praise the Lord. Come on, pray. Everybody pray. Come on, let's pray for our lighthouses. Let's pray for our pastors. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Come on, let's pray for boldness. Come on, let's let the church be the church. There's a reason they killed them in the beginning. They're so counterculture. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. We need an awakening in the church. We need an awakening in our country. Well, let's pray. An awakening right now. Let's pray.
Father, we need revival. God, we need an awakening. Lord, I need revival in my heart. Lord, bring a, f- a breath of fresh wind in this house. The whole world's waiting to see if there's somebody that will not to give up, that will not throw in the towel, that not will faint. The Bible says, faint not, faint not, faint not. Don't faint. Faint not. Don't quit. We're just now touching something. You hear me? We're just now touching it. We're just now where we need to be to go to the second level. All of you are needed. Every one of you are needed. If you don't pray, then who's going to pray? If you don't come, who's going to come? If you don't work in the waters, who's going to work in the waters? Hear me? Be bold. Let's be light. Let's persevere. Let's push ahead. opportunity. Father, whomever stands behind this pulpit, every staff member, every guest speaker, Lord, I pray they'll be bold as a lion, saturated with love, grace, and mercy. But God, they'll not water down the truth. They'll weep, they'll cry, they'll stand before broken men being broken. We will not be argumentative just to argue. God, we will tell the people that they can be free. Set this nation free. Set it free. Everybody in the house said amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. Shut up. All right. Let me give this instruction to you. Make sure that today uh, that you're here for prayer at 5 o'clock. We're going to need it. By this afternoon, uh, I will have responsibilities. um, um, Or not responsibilities. I will will probably be inundated with stuff. Okay? And I need you to pray. I need you to hold the line. I need, you to, I need you to hold the line, okay? All right? Come and pray. Five o'clock. I told the people last night, preaching never started the revival. It will not sustain it. Worship didn't start the move of God, and it will not sustain it, as important as those are. The only thing that moves the heart of God in this way is prayer. He says, my eyes are open and my ears attentive to the prayer, not not your attendance, but the prayers made in this place. I beg you. I beg you. To pray with your pastor. It's easy not to. But pray with your pastor. So, Lord, make us a prey people. We may not be able to do much, but we can all pray. Um, Amen. Last announcement. John Barge, come on up here quickly. Many of you know that Lorraine is her is his wife and healed of the 50 cancerous lesions, running for the state school superintendent, the state the state board, to be the principal over all principals. You're having a town hall meeting at City Gate Church at Thursday night at seven, right? And you're going to be talking about the critical race theory regarding that in our schools. All right. And so, uh, where can people go? One. To find out information about you as a candidate, but also to donate. Church, listen to me. All of, I'm not telling you anything you ought to do, but all of us need to support his 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 candidacy. All right, all right. And he needs money. 
Signs cost, advertisements cost. Where can they go, John? Uh, our website is uh, johnbargega.com. Uh, we do have a Facebook page. If you go to the website, you can follow us on Facebook. But all of the different things, uh, you know, things are kicking up as far as campaign events. And so we've got this town hall coming up. We'll have another one. I think uh, Dana uh, Fowler is trying to work on one that we're going to uh, potentially do here uh, in, in the coming uh, future soon. Uh, so follow us on Facebook and Twitter and, and all those things go out. Our calendar's there. And, um, but uh, johnbarchga.com and there's a donate button right there. Okay. So I just want to encourage you guys to do that. Send you right oh, hand. City Gate Church, Atlanta. I believe the address is uh, 5800 uh, Medlock Bridge Road, uh, Peachtree Corners. Okay, Peachtree Corners. Wonderful. Extend your hand toward John. Lord, we pray that your blessing could be upon him and Lorraine and the family. Thank you, Lord. We need principled men, principled women. Lord, we don't need Christians, but we need godly people. Godly people in office. We thank you, Lord. Blessing, keep him safe. Bless our church tonight, tonight. Lord, bless it. Kevin Wallace, blessing, Lord. And everybody in the house said amen. Amen. See you tonight at 5 o'clock. Love you guys.